Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're, we are still waiting on um, a couple of panelists, but we can um, get to them uh, at the end if um, they uh, need some more time. So um, I just want to welcome everybody uh, to the POQ special issue webinar hosted by DC APOR. Um, the session is being recorded and will be posted on the DC APOR YouTube channel. So I'm Shelley Fewer. I'm the program chair for DC APOR, and I welcome you all to this uh, annual event. The panel today includes editors and authors of the 2022 special issue of Public Opinion Quarterly, Race, Justice, and Public Opinion. So this includes six presentations on the journal articles uh, and an introduction by the editors. Because we'd like this event to be uh, more discussion-based, each speaker will have about five minutes or so to present, and then we'll have five minutes for questions and discussion after their presentation. And then after everyone's presentations and you know, mini Q&A, we'll open it up for question and answer with all authors um, at the end. I encourage you to post your questions in the chat as they come up. Uh, if we're not able to um, answer your question uh, during the time after the presentation, the presenters can try to answer your questions in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started. It is my pleasure to introduce the editors of this special issue, uh, David Wilson. Um, he is the Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley, and a professor of public policy and political science. His public opinion research uh, focuses on survey measurement and response, questionnaire design, and data analysis. Uh, Maria Kreisen is a professor of sociology at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and her areas of research are racial attitudes and residential segregation. So let's welcome everybody, and let's welcome David and Maria. Thank you, Shelley, and thank you, DC APOR, for hosting this event. Thank you to all the contributors to the special issue, and thank you for everyone out there uh, in the, the virtual world taking time to, to allow us to share some of our work and some of our ideas that led to the to the special issue. Briefly, I want to have Maria Kreisen just, uh, just offer a few uh, welcoming comments about uh, how, how we got into this this job in the first place, and then I'll maybe offer some context about how we shaped uh, the agenda for the special issue. Thanks, David. Um, so I, it feels like 100 years ago because it was in August of 2020, so the world was different. It's still different for me. I don't know what yesterday was. But um, uh, we this opportunity arose to edit this special issue, and I would not have undertaken it or even considered it without David Wilson saying, yeah, I'm game to play in this sandbox with you. And um, so we, I was fortunate enough to be able to work with him to really conceptualize this entire thing. Um, he really drove a lot of it and we had a great division of labor and um, it was just great to have that kind of cross country collaboration during the time of the pandemic, I will say. Um, and I guess the only thing I wanted to say, um, well, two things, one was, one of the first conversations I remember having with David, we we sort of said to ourselves, you know, there was the special issue on on race, I think in 1990-ish, uh, that Larry Bobo edited, I believe. If I'm not, see if my brain has addled completely. 797, is that what you're telling me, David? Um, and that just we were literally on the on the phone on a Zoom call, and I said, Well, what was when was the first article published on race in POQ? And I I just like had honed my Googling skills and my skills, whatever. And I got back to the 1938 issue of POQ that had, as far as we can tell, the first article in POQ that had something to do with race. Um, it was by Jesse Daniel Ames and it was called The Editorial Treatment of Lynching. And it, it is featured in the at the end of the special issue. And I thought that was a brilliant touch. Um, thanks to Eric Plutzer for that idea. Because um, it really contextualizes so much. It, it, it was just this, amazing example and it was so it had so many um, connections to what we were hoping to do with this special issue topically. Um, it's one of those things when you read things from the 30s and 40s and you think, oh yeah, there's a lot of the same issues being <laughs> addressed now, different characters, different contexts, but a lot of the same struggles. So um, that's all I wanted to say and let David take it away from there. <laughs> 
Thank oh, you, you know what? I lied. I lied. I, I said there were two things. <laughs> the second thing I did want to say, this was late breaking, literally last week, or maybe it was two days ago, maybe it was three days ago, I was at a presentation by an undergraduate student here at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and he was doing a research presentation as a senior sociology major, and I was sitting there watching as he talked about racial attitudes was his topic. I didn't know that was going to be his topic. And he pulled up one of the articles from this special issue as his data point and as his example, because he was talking about attitudes towards reparations. So that I made him recreate, I have it on my phone. If I could figure out a way to hold it up, I took, I made him recreate the moment so that I could take a picture of him with the slide of, of the paper on the PowerPoint presentation. So I thought, oh, look at this, look at the special issue has been brought to life and is shaping the minds of my young students here at UIC. That's outstanding. And and I had to do a little research myself on how, how things have been going with the special issue up to this point. And I found that there have been already 10 citations, uh, 9,471 views, and we have an ultra, alt, altmetric ra average rating of about nine. So the word is out. Uh, thank goodness for the internet uh, being stronger now than in 1997, where everything was was being mailed and uh, you know kind of printed, and so uh, we're we're really proud of how the issue came out. And so the context was the the Ames paper helped us really think about what mattered in the early part of the century, uh, the prior century, and what really matters now. And are there any consistent connections between the two? And we landed on, of course, there's race and there's justice, but there's also how the public thinks about these issues and how they're communicated in a host of factors. So the, the special issue arose out of an outpouring of all those racial injustices that were happening around 2020, including the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Floyd was, of course, uh, killed over a potential counterfeit $20 bill, and Breonna Taylor died while she slept in her bed because of a, a no-knock search warrant issued and negligence by the police. And there was another instance, of course, with Ahmaud Avery, who was exercising on a road in Georgia, and he was ultimately pursued, assaulted, and killed because the assailants wanted to intimidate him and question him about a potential trespassing. And so when you think about the inputs being things like, you know, sleeping in bed, potentially with someone who might be a, a criminal or, or counterfeit bill, or just exercising and going in the wrong driveway or going on the wrong property, that the outcomes could be disproportionate to those inputs and therefore there'd be an injustice. And so when you're thinking about scales of justice, there are scales for a reason. When they're balanced, things seem to be fine, but when they're imbalanced, there's a problem. The inputs don't equate to the outputs. Those were examples of the scales being unbalanced on race. And so we wanted to start with uh, a contextualizing of race and justice and how the scales are imbalanced and how Americans and the public more generally think about how they can actually repair uh, the harms that have happened and whether or not they're even important to the public. So justice is conceived of an, as an international idea, but it is core to the moral foundations of the United States and America because it's codified in our constitution. So as the preamble states that the people are charged with the protection of justice, that is to uh, establish justice to ensure domestic peace and tranquility. So, so this reference to justice says that America's committed to it in some form or fashion. And, but from politics to policies and at the time pandemic, uh, race appeared to affect how voices were thought about and were considered in the large debate. And we said they're also relevant to how they're considered in the literature on public opinion. So the absence of racial justice in the many facets of American public life led us to think about what should we do? What should we uh, look for in the research? We started with uh, Jim Gibson's work on justice, where he says that um, justice judgments matter and are perhaps even the most important criteria in the calculus of public opinion formation. This is because one does not have to be a party to any dispute in order to care about the fairness of a policy or an outcome. Basically, People care about injustices done to others. You can observe and watch these things from afar and still be affected as if you were a part of the process. Injustices draw our attention, our beliefs, our emotions, and they direct our behavior and they motivate us to change or not change. And as a result, if we're still seeing racial injustices uh, pervasive, 
then we're called to investigate the extent to which the public views the events that we see as actual injustices, whether the, recip the recipients of injustices potentially are deserving of better treatment or not, whether their identities as a racial group are relevant, and ultimately whether the status quo is in any need of change. So more apt for our public opinion conversations, the questions are, are scholars and practitioners of survey research and polling doing enough to understand and include the voices uh, and the relevant material that's needed to understand the voices uh, in our research on, on justice and public opinion and American democracy. And so against this backdrop, we actually thought it was great to think about race beyond prejudice, beyond racism, beyond the traditional ways of thinking about uh, the impacts of race on democracy uh, as we know it. So that was the setup. And what we did was we found ultimately five to six pieces that were really great and that aligned with this, this calling. There were a number of other pieces that were outstanding, but weren't on race and on public opinion, but weren't necessarily aligned with the kind of work that we wanted to do. So uh, we'll get into each of the articles. And I don't know, Maria, if you want to kind of elaborate on anything I said or if you think that was OK. Good to go. Well, the gift and the curse was that uh, I submitted something to the to the special issue. I didn't review it. Maria didn't review it. It was reviewed through another process. But it was the article we decided we'd start with uh, in the journal. And so I'll, I'm going to share my slides and just walk through my article for about five minutes, and then we'll we'll go. I'll do an introduction to each of them as we go, if that's okay. All right. I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully this works. Can you see the prospect of anti-racism? Wonderful. So the that article by Darren Davis and I, and, and Darren was, was slated to present this, but of course he found something else to do. So here I am. Um, but but I'll share a few of the slides that, that I put together pretty quickly. Basically, we were looking at the reckonings of 2020 and the ways in which anti-racism was being called as a prospective approach to how we change some of this. And anti-racism is explicitly about action and actions towards alleviating racial inequality and racial injustices. It's one thing to say that you abhor racism and that you're against it and that it's an evil thing. And it's another thing to take action when you see it. And so we thought about the motivations that would be required for anti-racism to actually be effective as a practice and as a framework. And so that meant that we had to contrast it with other competing ideas, such as, I don't really like the group, or I don't feel close enough to the group to want to do anything, even though I dislike racism and I think prejudice is a horrible thing. And then we thought about, well, what motivations and what beliefs and what ideas can disrupt that process of wanting to take action? And one of the leading uh, theories on, on resistance to change is system justification theory, which holds that there are these legitimizing beliefs that tell us that action is not really worth it. And so some of those beliefs call on us to think about the way the system is already set up, and if it's set up fine, why change? Others say, well, if groups are not doing their part, why should I stick my neck out to support those groups or take actions and confront others on behalf of those groups? And another legitimizing belief could be like, hey, the problem's not as bad as it was in the past, so why do we need to change anything? So these beliefs can get in the way of what is required for change and signal to individuals that, hey, maybe things aren't as bad and therefore I shouldn't take the risk. I shouldn't give up my place in line. I shouldn't protest on behalf of issues I know um, really matter. I shouldn't um, you know, you know, if, if I have a first class seat, give it to someone who I know has never had a first class seat. Th those kinds of actions to disrupt uh, historic inequalities and, and structural inequalities are difficult. And we wanted to talk about that and test those ideas out. And lastly, we wanted to see if, if potential allies were particularly susceptible to uh, this problem. And so we came up with a measure of anti-racism action orientation that we tested a number of items out and these three rose to the top. And basically they were agree disagree items that it's best to keep your feelings about racial prejudice to yourself. It's one item. The second one is, is I wanna say something about racial prejudice when I hear it, but the safest thing is for me to be quiet. 
And the third one is, I believe that I will make too many enemies if I were to say something about racial prejudice when I hear it. The more you, uh, you disagree with these things, that no, I shouldn't keep these ideas to myself. I should say something, and I, believe, I don't believe that I will make too many enemies. The more you, you, you disagree with those items and believe that you have a positive orientation, the more you have anti-racism action orientation. And the measure turned out to be pretty strong in terms of its psychometric properties and its distribution. The, the thing about uh, anti-racism action orientation is that we know that there's not a universal approach to any of this, that groups have different experiences with the race and they may approach it differently. So just briefly in table two at the top, you can see higher scores symbolize more anti-racism action orientation. You're oriented toward anti-racism. Among the groups, whites, African-Americans, Latinos, and Asians, African-Americans have the highest uh, anti-racism action orientation. That shouldn't be surprising. And among minority groups, uh, or relative to uh, whites and minority groups, minority groups have higher anti-racism action orientation. And among just minorities, African-Americans have the highest anti-racism action orientation. Liberals have higher anti-racism action orientation than moderates and conservatives. Democrats have higher anti-racism uh, orientation than independents and Republicans. And those who uh, agree that whites are privileged or have privilege actually have higher anti-racism action orientation. There's nothing really surprising about this. It just shows that the measure is consistent in terms of what we expect. But we wanted to test out what explains the differences uh, you know, in anti-racism action orientation. So we included measures of resistance to change. And I won't go through each one of these, but in the upper left-hand corner, you can see uh, we've used some system justification ideas and some just world belief measures that all signal that if the world is just and the system is fine, we don't need to change. Lower left-hand side, we use a measure of racial resentment toward African-Americans that Darren Davis and I have created and, and produced uh, numerous and tested numerous times over the course of the past 15 years or so. We included measures of racial affect towards uh, racial groups. We included, included questions about the prevalence of race, and we included, of course, self-identified race. The key takeaway from all of this is when you look at uh, most of these measures in a bivariate fashion, it's clear that the, the typical things matter. More resistance to change, lower anti-racism. More racial resistant, lower anti-racism. African-Americans, higher uh, support for anti-racism, more orientation towards it. You have more positive affect towards racial groups, you're going to have more anti-racism action orientation. That's in the zero order correlations component. In the second part, you'll see that uh, with as you increase any of these things in a full model, you'll tend to see those effects start to erode to the point of when you only look at white respondents, you lose any impact of, of the racial affect measures or many of the other kind of uh, standard demographic measures. And the only things that matter are racial resentment and resistance to change. And so we just tested out the interaction between the two and people with more resistance to change, they don't feel like there's any real reason to change, tend to have lower anti-racism action orientation. But even though people who are open to change, even though they're open to it, as they increase their levels of racial resentment, they come to look like those who actually are more resistant to change. So it's about resistance to change, but it's also about how people think about race and deservingness. And we go through a little bit of teasing those effects out uh, throughout the paper. And finally, at the end, we test these out among Democrats, liberals, and conservatives. Um, and we find that political allies, liberals and Democrats, and those who, who believe that white privilege exists, we actually find that as they increase their racial resentment or as they increase their perceptions about resistance to change, they have the lowest levels of anti-racism action orientation. So non-racist actually can still be enablers of racial inequality and racial injustice if they make a calculus about who's deserving of what in society. So we, we try and talk about the combination of politics, race, and justice, and key to justice is this notion of deservingness. So this is just a short overview of the paper, and I, I appreciate you tolerating the time. I'm sure I went over there. So next we'll have, uh, the next paper is by, uh, let me stop my screen share. And the next paper is by Gabriel Sanchez and Raymond Foxworth, Social Justice and Native American Political Engagement, Evidence from the 2020 
presidential election. The article is important because it makes a significant contribution to what we know about Native American public opinion. And the authors find that on average, Native Americans are moved to support candidates who are aligned with issues of social justice and equality, especially if they reside on or near tribal lands. So Gabe and Raymond, please take over. All right, good afternoon. Hopefully you all can hear me and see my screen. Um, Big thank you to the organizers for inviting us, and um, thank you to everyone attending. Uh, I will uh, be presenting our paper with Gabe Sanchez, and then I'll kick it to Gabe later in the presentation to, to bring us home in terms of summarizing our findings and things like that. Um, this paper really builds on a series of projects that Gabe and I have been focused on related to Native American politics. Uh, really hoping that the field can better understand and pay attention to this important subgroup in American politics. Um, as David um, summarized greatly at the top, 2020 was um, really a, 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 an unprecedented year for many reasons. Leading up to the 2020 election, the, the global pandemic and demands for justice by people of color provided a setting for Native Americans to take political action and make strategic decisions about politics in that election. First, centuries of neglect made Native Americans more, more vulnerable to the COVID-19 pandemic. At different points during the early days of the pandemic, Native Americans led the nation in infection and death rates and did not have the capacity or support from state and national governments to effectively respond to the pandemic. At the same time, um, in the summer of 2020, after the unjust murder of George Floyd and other Black people across the country, Native Americans also took to the streets, demanding an end to police violence. With this backdrop in mind, this paper explores how the COVID-19 pandemic and demands of social justice uh, shape motivation for Native Americans to participate in politics, more specifically protest, and also their vote choice. We use data from the Latin dis Latino Decisions 2020 American Election Eve poll. Um, that poll uh, included uh, 1,300 interviews with self-identified Native American voters. This is the largest sample of Native American voters in the 2020 election. Uh, for this paper, as I sort of hinted at, we use two dependent variables. The first is a vote choice variable, um, and this is coded as a vote for Donald Trump or not. Uh, among Native Americans, 35% voted for Donald Trump, 60% voted for Biden, um, and 5% voted for, for someone else. Our second dependent variable asked respondents if they had attended, attended a march or a rally to support racial justice or protest. Um, excuse me, attended a march or a rally to support racial justice or protest for police brutality. 18% of Native American respondents noted they, that they had attended a protest or rally in 2020. Um, we include a host of uh, control variables that are listed, but I wanna talk a little bit more about some of our key independent variables. Um, first, uh, uh, is this key independent variable that asked if racism and discrimination had increased, stayed the same or decreased in the past four years? You can see that Native Americans were less likely to say that discrimination had increased compared to other people of color, and perhaps because this is this is because of the long history of colonialism um, that Native Americans have had to contend with. Um, and 51% of Native Americans did say discrimination and racism had stayed the same. The other key independent variables that we use are around issue salience. We code two separate variables from a question that asked respondents about the most important issue facing their communities that politicians should respond to. Uh, we created a coronavirus um, pandemic salience measure, and separately we coded a um, measure around discrimination and racial justice being named um, the top problem that a uh, politician should address. Um, address. You can see that the pandemic was the most important issue named by Native Americans, and Native Americans were only second um, to Black voters in naming discrimination and racial justice as a key issue that politicians should address. One more thing before I throw it to Gabe uh, to take us home. 
In addition to the uh, coronavirus pandemic salience measure, we also included um, another question around COVID-19 infection. Um, that question asked respondents, have you or a family member or a friend um, uh, contracted the, the virus or become ill due to the coronavirus? Um, this was included in the models as another measure associated with the global pandemic. And Gabe will, can say a little bit more about that um, in the findings, but I'm gonna turn it over to Gabe. Interesting. Thank you, Dr. Foxworth. Again, thanks everybody for saving us the time. I won't thank everybody who organized this, but you all know who you are. Thank you and much appreciated. Um, as, as Dr. Foxworth noted, you know, our primary goal uh, with this analysis was to identify what measures we could tap in within this data set that focus on social justice, racial justice, et cetera. And you see across our two dependent variables, just to summarize the main findings of our results relatively quickly, we found some consistencies across both vote choice and motivation to attend a rally to support racial justice or protest police brutality. Uh, most notably, uh, perceptions that discrimination directed at Native American communities have gotten worse over the past four years uh, motivate both um, support for uh, Biden and away from Donald Trump in the 2020 election, as well as increased a uh, desire to attend a rally or protest, again, specifically focused on racial justice issues. And as you saw the, the, the frequencies on that measure, you know, the fact that such a large segment of the Native American population indicates that as bad as things have been over that four year period in terms of discrimination, things were only essentially status quo, I think speaks to the deep rooted injustices that this particular community faces. Um, we also found that in terms of issue saliency, naming racial and social justice as the most important issue among those uh, that folks had an opportunity to identify, um, motivated again, uh, attendance and, and rally uh, to support racial justice and was uh, negatively correlated with support for Donald Trump. So we see significant you know, findings in the context of our main measures of, of racial justice. Uh, but we also found, as, as Ray noted, that attitudes and interactions and experiences with the pandemic had somewhat of a nuanced relationship with our two dependent variables. On the one hand, um, ranking the coronavirus pandemic as a highly insalient issue of uh, decreased support for Donald Trump. That's obviously likely uh, tied to the perception among many of the respondents in the survey that Donald Trump did not move quickly enough to address the pandemic. And obviously, as you heard from Dr. Foxworth, that had significant implications for tribal communities in particular. Uh, but when we looked at the second dependent variable determining uh, attendance in a march or rally or protest, although issue salience wasn't necessarily the, the strongest factor uh, that motivated that level of political participation, we did find that being directly impacted by COVID-19 uh, measured by um, people in your personal networks having the virus was definitely a contributing factor. So COVID-19 definitely was an important contextual factor that drove Native American participation, but you see it was nuanced. Um, we also tried to include measures that were specific to tribal communities across the United States. Again, this being one of the few articles that we're aware of that looks specifically at Native American voting behavior and political participation. We wanted to make sure we just add um, some important findings scholars should consider utilizing moving forward. One of those was living on tribal lands um, or near reservations. And you see that that motivated in terms of individual variation for, for Native Americans, less likelihood of voting for Donald Trump and increased likelihood of, of political participation through a rally to support racial justice. Next slide, Ray. So just in, in terms of, of wrapping things up for uh, our overall conclusions and implications of our work, you saw that Native Americans were highly motivated by social justice in the COVID-19 pandemic in the 2020 election. We obviously don't feel this is unique to 2020. And in fact, Dr. Foxworth and I um, are utilizing some similar survey data from the 2022 election to build on the work that we've done here. The sample size isn't as, as large, but it gives us the opportunity to see if this was unique to this particular election or if we see motivation by social justice to influence Native American uh, political behavior moving forward. Uh, we find that this study uh, contributes to our overall understanding of Native American participation and voting behavior, two highly understudied areas of research within the larger field of political science. And we hope this also provides some insights on conducting survey research with this population. We didn't speak to it a lot in our presentation, but in the, the actual uh, paper that we hope all of you will go grab, read, and cite, um, it, it, we also looked at some nuances to how you conduct survey research with this understudied 
uh, population. For example, in the screening mechanism at the survey, we looked to screen out any respondents that only had weak connections to their Native American ancestry. For example, folks that indicated their only, uh, I guess, ancestry with Native Americans or distant relatives. We screened those folks out of the sample. Uh, Dr. Foxworth and I are looking at other sample designs to think about whether or not excluding that population has implications into who we define as Native American in survey samples. So again, things we can talk about in Q&A in terms of our future insights on doing polling with this particular community, but hopefully this was helpful and expands all of our insights into this particular uh, population that's often understudied. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray and Gabriel. The next paper is uh, Police Abuse and just, or Just Desserts, Deservingness Perceptions and State Violence by Mackenzie Israel Trummel, who's an assistant professor of government at William & Mary, and Shea Streeter. This article examines the efficacy and promise of restorative actions, compensatory justice, so to speak. And among their results, they find that public support for compensatory justice depends on the perceived responsibility of both the victim and the police. This is important for understanding racial bias, especially the differences in perceptions of the order component of law and order. Mackenzie, please take it away. All right, hopefully everyone can hear me and see the screen. Oh, decided to advance itself. Um, so as David said, thank you so much. I'm Mackenzie Israel Trummel. Um, my co-author, Shay Streeter, was unable to be here today, um, but she sends her best to everyone. Um, so I will jump right in with thinking about uh, what, why we sort of started this project. So one of the things that we know from survey data over a long period of time, is that police are widely trusted in the United States, but at the same time, US police are particularly violent compared to police in other nations. Um, so, you know, the best estimates are that police kill on average three civilians every day and engage in many violent policing practices um, that don't rise to the level of lethal violence at the same time. We also know, of course, that policing is highly uneven and targeted in the United States, so that communities that Sauce and Weaver define as race class subjugated experience incredibly aggressive and targeted policing day to day, while communities that are not subjugated on the basis of both race and class tend to um, have very limited experience with police officers and see them quite differently. This, of course, means that we have really divergent attitudes in public opinion data toward police across racial categories of respondents. And so what we're interested in here in this project is how perceptions of who deserves restorative justice for police violence might be conditioned by identity categories. And so just to briefly um, introduce the way that we try to look at this in this project, we fielded a survey experiment on a large sample of white and black Americans in which we gave people a mock news article describing a realistic incident of police officers beating a detained civilian. Um, many of the details from the article came from real examples of violent police interactions, both in terms of the language coming from officers as well as um, the quotes from the civilian. The treatment that we have in this experiment is the race and gender of the detainee. So the detainee was either a white man, white woman, black man, or black woman. And we look at a series of outcomes here. The one that we spend the most time on in the paper is re whether respondents say that the detainee deserves a financial settlement for being beaten. That is, do they see this as an injustice that requires remedy through one of the few ways that victims of police violence ever achieve any measure of justice in our system? We also look here at perceptions of fault for the outcome, asking people if they think that the police officers or the detainee could have done anything differently to, to have a different outcome, um, and people's perception that the detainee may have been involved in criminal activity prior to the beating. And so I'll talk you just through just a few of our findings here. Um, this pulls together all of our respondents, and it's just looking at what are the treatment effects of changing the identity of the detainee on people's support for a financial settlement. And so what we see is that the white female detainee is most likely to be seen as deserving of restorative justice via a settlement procedure, and the black female detainee is seen as least deserving. Um, these, uh, these, this, you know, the white female detainee effect is significant. Um, these are not, you know, massive effects. It's not the case that certainly everyone is in agreement that um, that particular detainee should be given um, 
restorative justice and others should not, but there are some small effects by the, the identity of the detainee. But what we see when we break apart respondents is really just these very large racial differences in how respondents think about the circumstance. So on the left side of the screen, you can see white respondents with triangles indicating men, circles indicating women. And on the right hand side of the graph, these are black respondents again with the same symbols by respondent gender. And so we see these really large differences in respondent sense that this is an injustice that requires some form of restitution where white respondents are about 50-50 likely to say yes or no to this. And there's small movement around different um, detainee identity categories, whereas black respondents are just overwhelmingly likely to say that um, the detainee should get a settlement. We also see some small gender effects here where female respondents are more likely to say that um, that ju uh, restorative justice is is required. Um, so this is the first sort of striking thing that we that we really notice here that um, white and black respondents seem to have just fundamentally different views of whether or not civilians who have been beaten by the police are in some way owed justice as a result. We then also look at um, trying to predict restorative justice preference via these settlements by both the treatment conditions as well as respondents' perceptions that the detainee, the police may have been at fault and criminal involvement. And so what we see here in models of white men and white women respondents are that people really are using their perceptions of what happened, who was at fault to decide whether or not they deserve a settlement. And so if we look, for example, at um, the people who say that the detainee is most at fault versus least at fault, we're seeing a change in the predictive probability of saying that there should be um, a financial settlement of 0.58 for men and 0.61 for women. So that's how big those shifts are. And we see similar shifts for faulting the police um, and then slightly smaller but still pretty large um, effects for perception of criminal involvement. When we look at Black respondents, um, the only one that really matters to that same magnitude is thinking that the police were at fault. Um, so those who say the police were the most at fault versus least at fault, we do see big changes in support for a financial settlement. But again, this is really reflecting the fact that Black respondents just have a much higher baseline of saying anyone who experiences violence from police is deserving of some sort of um, restorative justice process. So just to sort of sum up, we have small detainee identity effects where the, the um, race and gender identity of the, um, of the beaten detainee does in some ways shape how people think about whether or not they deserve justice. But we have just really widely divergent views on restorative justice itself by respondent race, where white respondents seem to see police violence as often justified, while black respondents seem to see police violence as very rarely justified. So I will leave it there and thank you so much. Thank you, McKenzie. Share my screen. Uh, did David, there's David, glad you joined. Um, next paper is David Doherty, uh, Connor Dowling, Michael Miller, and Michelle Tuma. David, you're presenting political science professor at Loyola University in Chicago. The title of the paper is Race, Crime, and Public Sentencing Preferences. Uh, the paper uh, uses a really, I think, innovative approach uh, through conjoint to and an obtrusive measure of race, uh, which is really interesting, to reveal that individuals actually use many different kinds of characteristics and beliefs and, and criteria for uh, criminal sentencing uh, thoughts. So it's not just about the, the race of the individual, but maybe thinking about the types of crime they committed and, and, and what, the, uh, what the, the effect of the crime actually is. I think it, it really shows that racial inequality can be sustained by more than just racial bias. And I think it's really impactful and important paper. So David, please share. Well, thank you all for, for having me. Uh, apologies for joining a little bit late. Apparently I still have to learn about the fact that the United States has multiple time zones. Um, apologies again for, for being late. So um, this is a project that uh, my co-authors and I view as what we hope will be the first step in a much broader research program. And so the project is really motivated by um, two observations. One is that um, we know that we have a remarkably punitive uh, justice system in the United States. 
We know that uh, polls have long asked people questions about things like whether they support the death penalty, whether more money should be spent on preventing crime, et cetera. Uh, but we don't really know very much about what people view as a suitable punishment for a given crime. That's observation number one, is we don't know very much about what people view as a suitable punishment for a given crime. The second observation is that there are clear uh, racial inequalities in the way uh, justice is measured out in the United States. We also know uh, that public attitudes uh, have some level of influence on criminal justice policy. And so a sort of additional question then becomes, uh, to what extent are people's ideas about what constitutes an appropriate punishment for a crime contingent on uh, the purported race or the race of the defendant? So our data come from the 2020 uh, cooperative election study. And the focus of the design is really on a conjoint experiment. And in the experiment, we presented respondents with a series of six profiles of people described as having been convicted of a federal crime. And so we varied what the crime was. We varied uh, whether the individual had priors. We varied whether they were on probation. We varied their age. We varied um, whether they were employed. And respondents for each profile were asked whether any prison time was appropriate, and if so, uh, how much prison time was uh, appropriate. Um, so you can see the response options at the bottom. If someone, for example, indicated less than one year, we asked them to enter the number of months they thought was appropriate. If they in indicated one or more years, we uh, asked them for the number of years they thought was a suitable sentence. So we found very clear evidence that people were sensitive to the nature of the crime. Uh, for example, uh, an incident where an individual is convicted of shooting and uh, seriously injuring someone, uh, prescribed sentences were uh, dramatically longer than for what we might think of as sort of lesser crimes like forging uh, checks. We also see that just as the criminal justice system is sensitive to factors like whether uh, a defendant had priors, whether the defendant was on probation, uh, the public shows some degree of sensitivity to this. Uh, so that's sort of part one, is the public sort of shows sensitivity to what the crimes were. We, one of the things that's quite striking about the, the patterns of responses is there is a massive amount of variation in what people view as a suitable crime. Uh, some respondents were extraordinarily punitive, uh, even when crimes sort of seemed to be rather modest and federal sentencing guidelines suggest that, you know, a sentence of something on the order of like six or eight months is appropriate. We had um, some respondents indicating, you know, anything ranging from like a 10 year to a lifetime sentence was suitable. However, um, Another like real focal interest in this design was we wanted to assess the extent to which the purported race of the defendant um, affected the sentence that people prescribed. Our reasoning with how to signal the race of the defendant was uh, that we needed to contend with the possibility that people um, are going to try to um, squelch what might they might perceive to be socially undesirable tendencies. Right? So if we say the defendant was Black, respondents might sort of try to tamp down any um, negative uh, uh, dispositions they have towards uh, Black Americans, and uh, we might end up not finding a treatment effect when really there ought to be one. So our strategy was to use a pool of names that other researchers have identified as uh, distinctively signaling that an individual is either white or black. And in each profile, we randomly varied uh, the name that was presented as a way to signal the sort of purported race of the defendant. The direct effects of this treatment were null. So there are a couple of possibilities, right? One possibility is that people um, do not view uh, black defendants, for example, as deserving of harsher punishment than white defendants. Uh, 
Uh, another possibility is that the way that we uh, signaled the defendant's race was too weak or wasn't effective. However, a third possibility, which we investigate in the paper, is that this null aggregate effect actually masks some underlying variation in how different individuals respond to defendants who um, appear to be black or white. So we took advantage of some items that were included in the common content of the CES. Uh, two of these items are drawn from uh, the fire scale, two are from the standard racial resentment scale. We built this, these items into a summary measure that we label um, cognitive uh, racial attitudes. And we assess the extent to which the effect of the uh, defendant race treatment varied with people's uh, reported racial attitudes. And the findings suggest that they very much did. Um, among those with the what we might sort of describe like the lowest level of awareness of persistent racism, um, we find the pattern that we expected, frankly, to find in the aggregate, which is that when the defendant was uh, was had a, a quote unquote black name attached to them, uh, respondents were quite a bit more punitive. However, these effects appear to be offset by uh, respondents who we might label sort of the most racially liberal, I suppose, um, who actually displayed a bit more punitiveness when the, the defendant was described using a quote unquote white name. So the basic takeaways from this project are, one, this, again, I want to emphasize we view as sort of the first step in a broader project uh, that at its heart investigates how people view, uh, 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 how people view punishment and what comp comprises an appropriate punishment for a given crime, and two, um, investigates the extent to which racial considerations uh, affect those judgments. So in our future research, um, we've actually already started working on some of this. We're going to investigate how people respond to and prescribe sentences for lesser offenses, specifically misdemeanors. Um, we started with federal offenses because there are federal sentencing guidelines that all respondents who live in the United States sort of live under um, that we could benchmark respondent sentencing preferences to, prescriptions to. However, misdemeanor uh, offenses are obviously vastly more prevalent in the United States. So understanding uh, public attitudes about what comprises uh, an appropriate punishment, say for someone who- David, I'm putting you on the clock. Or, or committed a DUI. Excuse me, David, David. I'm putting you on the clock to wrap up. Okay, sorry, apologies. I will wrap up right now. Um, we're also uh, exploring other ways of measuring racial attitudes and trying to think carefully about uh, which attitudes ought to be most relevant in this domain. Uh, our first sort of follow-up study to this included an oversample of uh, Black respondents, the idea that we can hopefully shed some light on the extent to which Black and white Americans view these matters differently. And then further down the line, we're um, considering exploring additional ways to signal the, the race of a defendant and also explore the possibility that people respond differently when the defendant um, identifies with another ethnic or racial group or is identified as female rather than male. Thank you for your time. Thank you, David. The great part about having this special issue is that all the papers are really good. Uh, and I wanna make sure we have some time for, for Michael and, and Ashley's papers. Uh, so the next paper is Racial Identity Reparations and Modern Views on Justice Concerning Slavery. I think Michael Hughes is here from Sociology of Virginia Tech to present That's the right. paper. Michael, I'll let you do summary and presentation. Okay, so let me uh, uh, share the screen here. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, okay. All right, so um, uh, my co-authors, uh, Ashley Reichelman and, and Mike Roos, couldn't be here today. Uh, this paper is largely the brainchild of, of, of Ashley and grows out of work she did with Matt Hunt. And uh, uh, Micah is the, uh, is the methodologist. And uh, I added 
some of the elements on, on, on racial identity from my research on racial identity among African Americans. Uh, I've really compressed this. Um, and uh, to put it all into five minutes, I think I'll make five minutes. I may be a little bit over. The tables will are at the end. So if anybody asks me questions, then I can bring up the tables. But I've dropped out the tables. And um, basically, I'm just going to describe the, 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 the study and the findings. So, uh, so this study explores how racial identity affects people's endorsement of symbolic reparations for slavery. I'm gonna assume that you know what reparations are. They've sort of been alluded to already today. Uh, white people are more likely to oppose reparations than others are. And the key factors we hypothesize, the key factors that explain this are racial pride and beliefs about deservingness. So why do racial, why do attitudes vary by race? Well, reparations threaten, we argue, Reparations threaten white Americans' racial pride and thus their self-esteem uh, using you know, uh, Taj Fell's uh, social identity theory. Um, and, and they will like, likely be opposed. So why is that? Well, reparations imply that whites are responsible for the origin and the perpetuation of racial inequality. And we argue that among prideful whites, opposition is justified by the belief that black people do not deserve reparations or any special treatment. Uh, re reparations validate Black Americans' racial pride and will likely be supported. So why is that? Well, core elements in Black pride are uh, survival in, in spite of domination, enslavement, and racial violence, and collective efforts to, to overcome these. And reparations enhance pride by validating and legitimizing these elements. So our data came from Qualtrics, uh, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. We had about 3,000 3, uh, respondents. Um, and the distribution of race ethnicity is, as you can see there, uh, the multiracial category dropped out uh, by the end of our analyses because there just weren't enough of them to do decent analyses with. So our, our dependent variable was a, was a latent variable. Uh, three, three items that asked about an apology for the harms caused, should there be an apology for the harms caused by slavery? Should there be a dedication of a memorial? And is, does the nation have any a special responsibility due to the history, a responsibility to Black people uh, due to the history of slavery? The primary independent variables are racial identity, so which category uh, did respondents uh, uh, identify with? And then, and then uh, based on what they identified with, how, how, pri how, how, how much pride did they have uh, uh, in that racial identity? And then for our explanatory variable, uh, myths of undeservingness, we use some standard measures that I'm sure you're familiar with mostly. Uh, the, 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 the idea, the, the attitude that Black people lack motivation to pull themselves out of poverty, the rating of Black people's intelligence, the rating of Black people's work ethic. And then we added one in there uh, about whether uh, people thought that slavery was good for Black people. Uh, we did not create a latent variable out of these, and we used these as uh, individual variables uh, in the regression analysis. Uh, we found that, you know, as we expected, that white people were more opposed to reparations than were Black people at Latina, Latina Latinx and um, uh, and 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 Asians and multiracial though we dropped them out. Uh, when we looked at the effect of racial pride on opposition, we found there was a sharp uh, sharp association um, between racial pride and opposition among whites. That's this this positive uh, slope line, the the sharp one. Uh, however, um, among Black people and Latin let like in the Latinx category, we found that um, racial pride uh, decreased opposition considerably. And among Asians, it basically racial pride had no effect. When we controlled on those uh, variables tapping myths of undeservingness, uh, what we found out is the, that effect for whites was largely explained and it becomes quite fl nearly flat and, it's, it's in this, and the slope is insignificant. 
whereas the the um, the regressions for uh, for uh, for Asians and um, uh, and for African Americans and for Latinx respondents are basically unchanged from the from the previous uh, an analyses. So there are some pretty important limitations. We use observational data from an opt-in convenience uh, sample. So there are represented uh, representativeness issues that could that could be raised, and certainly causal causal claims are uh, have to be made with caution. We don't have any direct measures of white self-esteem, although it figured uh, um, uh, figured into our uh, theorizing about what's going on here. And we don't have any um, measures of whites' beliefs in their own deservingness. We don't have measures of other factors that might affect reparations, such as whether people feel pride in other groups, whether they identify with other groups, whether uh, and about their emotions, such as anger or guilt. But overall, we find white Americans are more likely to oppose reparations than others are. A racial pride increases opposition to reparations among whites but not among others. Um, myths of Black Americans' undeservingness largely explains the impact of um, racial pride among whites, but not among others. Uh, findings suggest that whites' beliefs about their own deservingness and their in endorsement of myths about Black Americans' lack of deservingness explain whites' opposition to reparations. And finally, uh, racial pride has different effects on re reparations attitudes across racial groups, we argue because of different perceptions of deservingness and justice. Uh, uh, we also argue in the, in the, um, the discussion uh, that white pride implies a belief in, 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 in a just society. So there's really no need for reparations and uh, because you know, if there is a just society, then 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 um, then black people and members of other racial minorities just need to fall in line, um, uh, uh, um, uh, and focus on individual effort uh, and not special or unjust uh, compensation. So I do have I do have some tables uh, if anybody wants to see the tables, but that's it. So thank you. Did I make like, five minutes? You 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 made over like we all have. We, oh, I'm we sorry. all we okay. all overestimate in our minds sorry. what five minutes feels and looks like, but it's okay. okay. Well, well, I cut it in half first, and then I had, and then I cut it by another half, and then I had to cut it again. So, um, so there's certainly math involved. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Right, she stopped sharing your slides there, so Ashley can come up. All right. Next paper is Ashley Jardina and Trent Oleren Shaw. Uh, they did a trends analysis looking at the polarization of white racial attitudes and support for racial equality in the US. Ashley, is Trent here as well? There's Trent, yep. All right, so thank you to Maria and David for putting together this fantastic issue. It's a privilege for Trent and me to be in such excellent company here. So as David mentioned, our contribution is a pull trend piece and the substance of which is documenting average levels of racial prejudice and opinion on racialized policies among white Americans from the mid 1980s to 2020. The motivation of our analysis comes from a long line of work studying what is known as the principal policy or principal implementation gap. This is a phenomenon in American public opinion in which many whites appear to widely endorse racial equality between black and white people in the abstract, while they simultaneously show little support for race targeted policies that would help achieve this racial equality. And to explain this gap, past research has found that white Americans individual level racial prejudices are an outsized factor in reducing support for racial egalitarian policies. And importantly, because these racial attitudes appear to have been so stable over time, so has resistance to these policies. Now, a great deal of the research on the principal policy gap was conducted in or before the early to mid 2000s. And really between that time and at least the 1980s, racial attitudes had in fact been really stable. But recently, researchers have begun to observe some unprecedented changes in white racial attitudes. And these have been driven in part by significant partisan polarization. 
So in light of this, our trend aims to document these shifts in white racial attitudes, to uncover the degree to which they're happening along partisan lines, and to see whether white that whether this attitude change is mirrored in any shifts in opinion on policies aimed at achieving racial equality. And also we examine whether any attitude change narrows this longstanding opinion gap in policies between black and white Americans. So the data we're going to look at to sort of uh, get some leverage on identifying trends over time is primarily the American National Election Study time series. Uh, so we are looking at cross sections going back to the 1980s up through the 2020 election. Uh, we replicate everything with the general social survey, but uh, for this presentation, we're just going to throw the a &ES, uh, figures at you. Uh, we look at two racial attitudes, racial resentment towards uh, Black Americans, uh, sort of this uh, mix of uh, the belief that Black Americans don't live up to sort of uh, the Protestant work ethic, that the, the explanations for longstanding racial inequalities are sort of rooted in, in culture and a lack of individual work ethic as well as anti-Black stereotyping. This particular measure is a difference measure between Black and white Americans as being hardworking versus lazy. Uh, and we're going to look at uh, two race-conscious policy preferences, so affirmative action in hiring and promotions, and then uh, specialized government assistance to Black Americans. And then we're going to look at a racialized uh, policy, which is welfare spending. So first, looking at these racial attitudes, uh, what we see here is the mean levels of white racial resentment over time dating back to 1986. And we're going to break this out uh, by white partisan groups, so white Republicans versus white Democrats. Among white Republicans and white Democrats in the 1980s, 1990s, and even early 2000s, uh, we see uh, mean racial resentment scores above this scale midpoint. Uh, we also don't see high levels of polarization between the two groups. It's the case that both white Democrats and white Republicans are on average reporting sort of moderately high levels of racial resentment. Uh, things are pretty consistent among white Republicans over this period, even up until 2020, this moment that we sort of think of as potentially a watershed for sort of uh, consciousness about race and racism in American society. The big change among white Americans we find is happening among white Democrats. So between 2012 and 2020, uh, mean racial resentment scores in the aggregate among white Democrats uh, are essentially halved. Um, so they're reporting extremely low levels of racial resentment by 2020. Similarly, looking at anti-Black racial stereotypes over time, uh, we see sort of uh, dating back to 1992 on this measure, uh, very little polarization between the groups in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Uh, white Democrats and white Republicans alike are reporting on this scale, um, values above 0.5 indicate relatively more anti-Black stereotypes, and values at 0.5 indicate sort of equal ratings of white and Black Americans' uh, work ethic. Uh, so it's the case that white Republicans over this entire period are rating white um, Americans as much more hardworking than Black Americans. Uh, white Democrats are doing something very similar up until 2020, where on average, sort of they hit essentially that midpoint. Um, they're right at 0.5. So there's some people rating whites a little bit more hardworking and some people rating blacks a little bit more hardworking. But overall, it's uh, they're, they're, they tend to offer pretty consistent ratings between these two groups. So this is sort of consistent with a lot of this work Ashley briefly mentioned, uh, big changes in racial attitudes in recent years. So our, con our big contribution here, we think, is sort of looking at these policy preferences. So do changes in racial attitudes sort of correspond with changes in racial policy preferences? And to an extent, they do. Um, so here we're plotting uh, mean levels of support for affirmative action over time looking at white Republicans, white Democrats, and bringing Black Americans into the mix. Of course, Black Americans uh, have long been much more uh, supportive of affirmative action than white Americans. Uh, but in recent years, we've sort of seen this considerable uptick in support for affirmative action among uh, white Democrats, but not white Republicans. Uh, in the GSS, uh, the gap between Black and white Democrats actually closes um, on that affirmative action item. It doesn't quite close, or doesn't even close to close, actually, in the ANES. Um, but what we do see is on uh, this item about government aid to Blacks, uh, the gap does close. So white Democratic support for uh, government assistance to Black Americans skyrockets between 2012, 2016, and 2020. And the difference between these groups is actually no longer significant in 2020. Again, no real change going on among white Republicans, though. It's a similar story for welfare, a racialized policy in uh, the US context. Um, we see that in recent periods, white Democrats and Black Americans are offering essentially equivalent levels of support for welfare spending, whereas uh, support among white Republicans is still very, very low. 
So to conclude, we find that among many whites, racial attitudes and racial policy preferences have considerably liberalized in recent years. And really it's so that an unprecedented number of white Americans actually support racially egalitarian policies. But the caveat, of course, is that these changes have been driven entirely by white Democrats, while attitudes among white Republicans have remained remarkably stable. So in forthcoming work, we show that these changes actually extend to the related domain of immigration opinion. And we also find that the association of racial attitudes to voting behavior has strengthened, meaning that these shifts have important implications for electoral politics as well. So I think what remains to be seen is whether the trends we've observed, particularly this profound shift among white Democrats, if they're gonna continue their trajectory or if 2020 was this peak moment in both opinion polarization and in the degree to which white Democrats' racial attitudes and policy preferences have become more egalitarian. So to be determined, especially as new public opinion data um, comes out. And so we'll have to wait and see. Thank you, Ashley and Trent. Uh, it's important to note that the, the final article that's in the special issue is by Jesse Ames, who wrote the article, of course, in 1938, but I'd encourage everyone to take a look at it and see how, uh, as a methodologist, she actually collected public perspective uh, by, by local uh, uh, paper editors on how they would communicate and present lynchings to the public, often rationalizing the behavior as just because of, of challenges to the system that uh, they perceived as being too slow. And um, we present, she presents a really nice case about the Scottsboro boys uh, court case and how in some ways there was, uh, there was good reason to be antagonistic on the matter of race because the court system was too slow and it was actually going through the process of justice, but they perceived it as not really serving their needs. So the way that justice works both on the positive and negative side uh, has really interesting effects on how the public reacts on the issue of race. And so since there is no universal arbitrator of justice that everyone can agree on, it makes these questions about right and wrong very kind of normative and subjective in the American uh, political ethos. So, so all of these papers, I think, speak to the challenges uh, of American democracy in that we have a lot of freedoms to, to say and express what we like, and we are constantly battling how information is presented uh, through the partisan lens, through uh, identity, through policy recommendations, and through practices by public institutions and public agencies um, to, to think about uh, treatment and this idea of establishing justice to ensure domestic uh, peace and tranquility. So I appreciate all of the, the contributors to the special issue. Uh, Maria, please offer anything in closing, and then we're happy to open it up for, for questions. I think we should go straight to questions. It's all good. Shelly, would you like me to facilitate, or are you, you in charge of the ship now? Sure, you can you can go ahead. Um, but I, I will actually just start by thanking everybody. Um, but I, I just want to say, uh, actually, you know what, let me just read the questions in the chat. And then after those are answered, uh, David, if you want to go ahead and, and continue with the Q with uh, the Q&A, that'd be great. All right. So one question uh, that was for David, which he answered in the chat, but thought maybe you could speak uh, to that a little bit more. Um, did you correlate the anti-racism action orientation measures with those that may have done something to be anti-racist? Were there any items asking about activism? No, yeah, I answered that there, there, there were no questions about activism in the survey and the anti-racism action orientation measures included the kinds of actions uh, or activism uh, behavior that we might suspect would be most correlated with uh, with with the items. So any intervention that would kind of uh, engage bystanding and and try and change people uh, would probably be correlated with the measure. But no broad or macro measures of activism, such as participating in a protest or um, voting, might be a form of activism, or or wearing a t-shirt or button might be a form. But those didn't have really strong correlations after controlling for all the other items. Okay, and then there's one other question in the chat. Um, do these changes among white Democrats reflect changing party demographics, the growing switch of college educated to the Dems and growing lower education groups to the Republicans? 
Yeah, th it's a, that's a great question. So, I mean, surely some of that is going on given that um, education is one of the strongest predictors of racial attitudes, but there's also a lot of evidence that this is actually really kind of a top-down story. So a lot of white Americans seem to both be changing their racial attitudes in response to the signals they're getting from party leaders about what those racial attitudes ought to look like. And then there is some partisan sorting going on where people are sort of moving to the party whose racial attitudes align with their group. But I think what's really most revealing is that within panel data, the same white Americans um, at point one, we can see are actually shifting their racial attitudes at time two. So this is happening within individuals. It's not just a sorting story. I don't know, Trent, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is that in 2016 and 2020, the ANES did a panel study. So they it did like this big re-interview of people who answered the 2016 ANES cross section. And um, there you can see sort of this individual level attitude change, especially among white Democrats. And that panel actually, uh, I have some work on this, understates the level of attitude change because you switch people from a face, uh, about a third of the sample switches people from in-person interviews to online web samples where we know white Americans are more willing to report sort of like anti-Black sentiments. Uh, so, in, so this is sort of some forthcoming work that uh, we're still exploring, but yeah, it definitely seems like there's individual level attitude change happening among white Democrats over this period. So I think what's what's useful is that you know we're we're a bunch of academics and we have offices on college campuses and data and the like. And and Michael, I'll get to your question in a second, but I think I'd like to hear from each each one of you very briefly on what uh, practitioners who are who are in the space and doing broader public opinion studies in specific areas of health and education or policy might think about including in their surveys to help get closer to these issues of understanding how justice matters in the in the study of race. Maria, you want to offer first? Is that a they, no? They, they don't have a, a tidy yeah. answer to that. Um, but I guess I can sort of state some some questions. So, uh, you know, I feel like the most rewarding research projects are the ones where you sort of answer a question and you have a bunch more questions that sort of flow out of it. Um, and I think one of the, the uh, questions that really flowed out of our project for us was how do we think about um, measuring racial attitudes and which attitudes are um, relevant in particular domains. There are changing social norms, a changing social context that might affect how people think about the questions we ask. Questions that have been asked for uh, many years might be interpreted in new ways. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done to, to continue to, to, to do, um, thinking really carefully about measurement uh, and the extent to which even even the same question asked to different people might be interpreted in quite different ways. Michael, you had thought. Uh, okay, well, in response to to your question, um, I I would really like to see more and better measures of racial identity. Uh, maybe Ashley Jardina would agree with me, uh, but we need more measures. Uh, the measures we a lot of the measures we have aren't aren't particularly good. And they don't particularly they don't account for really a lot of variation. Um, I'd like to see more people using uh, in-group evaluation, the stuff that was used in the in the the NSAL study, but I'd like to see that you know in other other kinds of studies looking at political more more of the you know I'd like to see that in the ANES. I'd also like to see that improved because um, it's it's an okay measure, but it really needs to be needs to be worked on. Also, I'd like people to ask about racial pride more. I'm, I'm really surprised by the fact that we don't have that in enough of the, the surveys. Um, so anyway, so that's what I would kind of like. Oh, and I'd like people in a lot of areas to use those measures too, of which is, I think at the heart of your question. And, and I, I, I have a question, but let other people respond to your, your query. Well, let me, I think Ashley in, in Gabriel, both have uh, unmuted. So Ashley, you want to offer something or do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, I think there are sort of two key takeaways from our work. One is that 
looking at white opinion in the aggregate when it comes to racial attitudes and racial policy preferences really obscures some very significant partisan differences. And so I think if you're doing work on race and racial attitudes, you have to look at white Democrats versus white Republicans. You can't just lump all whites together. And I think the other thing that we've been talking about is just the degree to which it, a sizable percentage of whites are actually really supportive of racially egalitarian policies. So people who are doing work on racial justice, um, I think, should think really hard about the fact that there is less opposition today than there has ever been among white Americans. I mean, that doesn't mean that there isn't resistance and that there aren't limits to the degree to which white Americans and white Democrats will support these policies. But I think that um, a lot of whites aren't as resistant as they have been in the past. And if Trent, you want to add any? Takeaways. Uh, just a just a sort of brief note. Um, I think the best time, really quick, the best time to have included a reparations question on, you know, the ANES or GSS would have been like half a century ago. Um, but the second best time would be today. So I would love to see sort of that question get asked more consistently in a sort of consistent question formatting, uh, because it's sort of this 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 tough uh, policy question to ask white Americans, whereas sort of like government assistance to blacks, which is one we look at is is maybe sort of we're seeing this big movement and i would have loved to have been able to sort of look at the same question wording about reparations over a long period of time and unfortunately we weren't able to do that in our paper yeah. gabriel yeah just to answer your, your question david on <clears throat> what are the main findings for practitioners of central take i'll say in follow-up work uh, ray foxworth and i just filled a survey a pretty large sample survey of non-native americans asking a lot of questions about their attitudes towards social justice as it pertains to Native American policies, reparations, basically a lot of what our panelists talked about, but specific to tribal communities. And as Ashley noted, upside is very strong support for most issues among particularly white Americans, but the level of, of limited knowledge, and in many cases flat out couldn't even give us a response, um, was extremely high across a lot of Native American issues that Ray and I assume the American public at least knows enough about to offer an opinion. So one upside uh, from the, the survey design that we put together is we put a lot of treatment effects, essentially half the sample, got a lot of informational content, intended to educate uh, particularly white Americans on some of these issues before we asked them about their, their attitudes and support for policy interventions. And especially in the context of reparations with those basic treatments, support goes up pretty significantly. So I think for practitioners out there, probably more so than if we're talking about the Latino community or African-American community, white Americans just don't know much about Native Americans and the struggles and the policy intervention. So I think we're going to have to do a lot of work in that area if we want to see policy action for those particular communities. Yeah, it's kind of a, a quasi deliberative poll. And, and I think that's one of the important parts. And Mark, I'm going to come to you for your question. Uh, but one of the important parts is that, you know, most people don't know issues beyond their own group on a host of things. So the ethnicity part of the conversation gets ignored because there are cultural elements that that are just outside the boundaries of, of what people experience in their general lives. Mark Schulman. Um, I'm just curious, what specific policies uh, have we been referring to? We talk generally about um, policies uh, uh, to uh, further racial justice, but um, what if we looked at specific policies as opposed to broad generalizations? Well, I, I just I think uh, Ashley and, and Trent looked at specific policies around welfare, affirmative action, and the like. I think McKenzie looked at law enforcement and criminal justice policies. David looked at sentencing policies. Gabriel, uh, you and Ray looked at some specific policy issues around COVID, public health, and and I would say free speech and expression policies. I think Michael, you all examined uh, some things around potentially uh, special considerations uh, and policies. So if there's, if there, so I think what we tend to do in, in most of our work is look at policies that are are bordering on racial, uh, you know, or being racialized or explicitly racial. But Mark, do you have some specific, you know, kinds of interest areas? No, not really. I just wanted to uh, delineate. Uh, exactly what we're talking about. And we do have a wide range of policies uh, that have been referenced uh, in these studies. Uh, so I just wanted to throw out the general question, but I think, David, you you answered it, uh, you know, well. Yeah, thank you. Michael, do you want to follow up on a question? Oh, yeah. So I wanted to ask uh, 
ask Ashley and Trent uh, about uh, this convergence that they seem to find. So I so uh, I really take the message that it's important to look at political party. So I'm going to pay attention to that now more than I have in the past. <laughs> and um, uh, but uh, but thankfully it doesn't undermine uh, previous papers that we've done before the 2000. So, uh, but uh, I can see what how important it is to look at it now. And I'm going to think about doing something like that with our reparations attitudes work. But but do do you think that you that the um, principal policy gap has been um, has closed has has been resolved among among white Democrats? Do you think it's closed now? And let me let me let me. So we we've got about I think about five minutes. So Shelley, you can tell me as we get closer. But I want to make sure, Mackenzie. I want to get your perspective on how we can build more survey experiments into uh, general practitioner uh, surveys as well. So Ashley sure. or Trent, um, let's let Ashley or Trent can answer the question about the principal gap, um, and then Mackenzie, you can come in and offer okay. experimentation. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Just a quick shout out. A lot of the really great work that had been done on this in the past was done by Michael. And sort of our argument is that not that that work is um, that we're not sort of contradicting that work. We're simply saying that things have changed remarkably in recent years in a way that they hadn't changed for decades prior to to this. So, I mean, we are finding that a lot of white Americans, at least in terms of what they're willing to report on public opinion surveys, are uh, in fact, um, really expressing very egalitarian views. Uh, there's some limits to this, and I think Trent is exploring some of this in his dissertation work. And you know, I think we're we're limited in terms of the policies that have been asked on these big public opinion surveys. One of the things I always offer up is the fact that if we were to ask questions about like um, housing integration or school integration, I think we would see more resistance. And with the principal implementation policy gap is probably persistent there. Uh, Trent, if you have Let's, let, let's let let's let McKenzie get get into where I think that's an outstanding kind of response to what Michael was asking. Um, so I guess just returning to the question of like what what survey questions we should be asking that we aren't doing a great job of asking right now. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about our measures of punitiveness and support for criminal justice. Um, and how limited those questions <laughs> tend to be, particularly at a moment where we've been sort of starting to have public conversations around shrinking the carceral state and reducing punishment. And a lot of our measures are still just sort of like, do you think that we should lock people up for longer? Do you think that we should, um, like, you know, like, what are your fears about crime? Do you think we should be more punitive? And I don't think we're doing a good job of measuring the potential for people to express views that we should actually be aggressively shrinking the carceral state. And so I, I would like us to, as sort of a community of people interested in these questions, think a little bit more about how to capture some of those attitudes going in the opposite direction um, to see if that's, if we really do see support for things like that, if we see, um, you know, support for policies designed around reducing crime that aren't punitively based, but instead are thinking about, you know, things like social welfare policy as a part of making communities safer. Um, and I, yeah, I think I think that's what I, I'm most excited to see us respond to as a community of researchers, the sort of shifts we've seen in rhetoric about what is the purpose of criminal justice, what is the purpose of justice, and how should we be thinking about those things? Yeah, I'd be curious to know among the panelists. I don't see many many questions pouring in, but just really briefly, like what you what you probably learned about in thinking about what you learned through the process of thinking about justice now in terms of measurement, in terms of theory, in terms of the the characters uh, and traits that center around justice. The the, the idea being that of course that uh, you know it, it's not just that you dislike or like a group or you have hatred towards a group, but there may be something else at play that that gets in the way of righting wrongs or or taking action to right wrongs. So just what was the value of of uh, participating in the in the special issue? If I could just jump in for one minute, we do have this is scheduled until 130. But if people are able to stay on for an additional few minutes, I think that would be lovely. So we can just, you know, wrap up this discussion. Yeah. I'll chime in briefly here. Um, 
one thing that sort of hearing hearing some of uh, the projects that others have worked on and something that I've been reflecting on a bit more um, is that policy change isn't driven in a sort of immediate direct way by public opinion. It's driven by policymakers who may or may not respond to, to public opinion. And I think one of the reasons the type of research people on this panel are doing is valuable is that um, it offers an opportunity for us to share information, perhaps with policymakers about what might be rapidly changing public attitudes uh, about policies like crime. Um, so I, I think this kind of work is really important in its ability to contribute as a a corrective or an informative sort of tool for uh, policymakers who might sort of still harbor per perceptions that the public is at a place that it was 20 years ago. I'll, I'll jump in on this one largely because I have to jam to a, a department meeting um, as soon as, as, soon as I, I, I answer this question. So I want to get in my, my tidbits. Uh, but I think one reflection is as I listen to um, all of all of the papers and look forward to reading all of them in the special issue. Um, a large focus is obviously thinking about white Americans and white voters attitudes towards social justice oriented policies. I think as, as Dr. Foxworth and I think deeply about next steps in our work, it's largely translating what we're finding in terms of white Americans interactions, knowledge with support for racial and ethnic minorities beyond Native Americans. And what nuances do we need to think about as we apply the same overall research designs and the same theories to really think about tribal communities? And one insight to leave you with as, as I think through this, as I'm working on some stuff with Brookings on multiracial population, um, you know, thinking about the Native American community is complex because the largest component of mixed race population are whites who say they're also indigenous in terms of their ancestry. So we need to think about that. What does that mean in terms of quote unquote whites attitudes? towards Native American social justice issue? Can we think about slicing our data in ways where we can isolate mixed race population, particularly indigenous, because they make up such a large component of, of tribal communities or people like, like myself who are Latino but have family that grew up on Native American tribes? How do we fit into that, that discussion and what does it mean for results when we talk about indigenous population in particular? Anyone else? Excellent. Shelly? Great. Okay. Well, again, I just want to thank all of you uh, for joining today and for sharing your work with us and for such a wonderful discussion. And uh, we appreciate everybody taking their time and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks.